It's ad break time. I'm proud to announce the Beyond Solitaire podcast is sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations. And as usual, they're up to some amazing things. Their next game, Hydrologic Cycle, is currently on Kickstarter, and you should absolutely go and check it out. CLGS also continues to offer classes in partnership with Gen Con. The next course, Jason Fury's Crowdfunding with Confidence, starts on May 6th and will teach you all about board games and crowdfunding. Go check it out. And I'll also include a final plug for myself. If you like the show and want to support it, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash beyond solitaire. Thanks to listeners like you. I've been able to keep upgrading my equipment, subscribing to StreamYard and more. Uh, but for now, let's get on with the show. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire. And this week on the pod, I have a very special guest. This is Elizabeth Hargrave, the very famous designer of Wingspan. How are you doing, Elizabeth? I'm good. I'm so happy to have you on at last. This is great. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, so I I'm trying not to just ask basic wingspan questions. <laughs> but I I know that you um I know that you got interested in making a game that was, I guess, about your own interests. And since then you have designed several games that are kind of nature and science themes. So Mariposas, um, you know, uh, mushroom one. Which that one called? Undergrove. Undergrove. There we go. Yes. Uh, yeah. And then um, you've also got the Fox Experiment. Right. Right. And so I guess I kind of wanted you to talk about, just to start, um, how do you choose a scientific or natural theme for a game that is the right balance, I guess, between true to life and compelling? Mm. I mean, I think I, I choose the idea first and then have to figure out that balance of how to <laughs> how to make it work as a game and not and like feel true but not be overly I don't know what the right word is like stuck so stuck in reality that it's not a good game um because you definitely have to gloss over some things and um so how I choose is sort of like I don't know. I have this running list of all kinds of things that are like, oh, that might be a game. That might be a game. But at some point I sit down and um, it's usually because I've had an idea of like what the the core mechanic in the game would be. That's sort of an expression of that thing that I wanted to do um, with Wingspan. It was just kind of like someone had said to me, what if you had raced for the galaxy, but with birds? Uh, so that was like the core thing for mariposas it was like oh the migration of the monarch butterflies obviously has to be movement on a map and there would be like flowers and places that they um reproduce and really like i was really fascinated by the fact that um no individual butterfly makes their own trip there's like four generations in a year and so you'd like how do you, how could you put that in a game and the same with fox experiment i was like very fascinated by the idea of like generations and how what could you do mechanically that would allow you to like pass along generational information that's how we ended up with the dry erase cards um yeah so it's sort of that of like it, the picking is really like that spark of inspiration that is how how would you implement this um, and then it's a lot of trial and error of like, okay, how much detail can you work in so that it, it feels true? Like I, I, one of my rules is sort of like, I can't put it in anything that's, that's just like outright wrong. Um, but there are things like an undergrowth where we don't really know we, people think that some of the, the mushrooms really probably specialize in, in some of the nutrients in the soil versus others like maybe one is better at phosphorus and one is better at nitrogen but nobody no actually knows or like which one is better at which so like there where we don't know like okay we can make it up uh that so that kind of that sort of thing that sounds so the, close to historical fiction i love it <laughs> yeah no i think there probably are a lot of a lot of parallels there um that yeah, you you try to make it so that what is there is true as long as you know what's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so with that in mind, you mentioned a lot of trial and error. Um, you know, yeah. you've put out actually a lot of games since Wingspan. Did you have several games in development at that time or have you just been very Yeah, that's a good question. Then? So wait, is it the, the development on Wingspan took about a year and then the art on Wingspan took another many months because it's 180 cards. Um, so part of it is that like I finished my work on Wingspan a full year before it came out um and in that year i did tussie messy and mariposas um and then they were tussie messy was like done very quickly and came out well i guess i and i entered both of that i got them signed both before wingspan actually came out um so that i had like this little queue of like stuff that all came out in 2019 um, or I guess Mary Post has rolled over and it came out in 2020. Is that right? Yeah. It came out during the pandemic. Um, and then, yeah, I, I actually don't work on a ton of games at once. I get very stubborn on an individual design and kind of want to get it done. Or I shelve it because I can't figure out how to make it work and they'll come back to it. But I'm not like actively working on a lot of stuff all at once. That's fair. Um, are all of the themes that you ha currently have in play kind of nature themed or um, do you have other things in store for us that you're willing to talk about? Um, well, so Picky Pixie just came out from Button Shy and that is not nature themed. It has flowers, but it's not like true to life. There's a pixie, so no. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Tussie Mussy is kind of on the edge, too. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. People are like, oh, flowers, it feels nature-y, but really you're like cutting bouquets of cultivated flowers. It's not particularly nature-y. Um, so yeah, so those are not like directly, it, but my, most of my bigger, I guess all of the bigger stuff that I'm working on, I did start a while back and then shelved because of the pandemic, um, a game about stunt people. It was like a oh, dexterity awesome. game <laughs> where meeples are like jumping off of buildings and stuff. Um, but I, when playtesting sort of shut down in the pandemic, there was really no way to playtest it online and I shelved it and I haven't pulled it back up. So like, I, it's not like a personal rule of mine or anything. It's just kind of the stuff that interests me. Um, and this, you know, if you're going to start working on a game, as you know, you're going to end up playtesting it hundreds of times, possibly. So it, it's it got to be something you actually want to be engaging with that much. Yeah, it does help to it does help to like it. So, you know, when you revisit Wingspan after all this time, um, do you still enjoy playing it? I do. Most of the times when I'm playing it is because I'm playtesting a new expansion. So I don't play like plain vanilla base wingspan very often at all. Um, but I do still enjoy it. I did have, um, when the app came out and when they were um, implementing the board game arena version, I definitely got to just play some games as a tester. It was just like straight up wingspan for no good reason. It was very enjoyable. Yeah. Hey, there's always a good reason to play a game. It's just to play. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I should say for no like work related for no producing a thing reason right like just just to play yeah I I actually still i was producing a thing because i was looking for bugs but yeah. <laughs> it didn't feel like it <laughs> so i wonder about that like especially because you know you've really skyrocketed to design fame um how do you feel that that change in your life has changed your relationship with games it sounds like you still do what you like and you make games about what you like but do you feel that expectation and fame and having this be a major part of your life in a different way, like changes how you approach play? Um, that's a really good question. I don't think it's particularly changed how I play. If I play with some of my other friends who are designers, we'll definitely sit around for half an hour afterwards and talk about like the structure of the game and why it works well or doesn't. Um, but I'm also able to turn that off when I'm playing with other friends who don't care. Like my spouse has no interest in that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just play a game. Um, so I may, you know, maybe it's changed it 
a little bit in that sense. It's definitely sort of a zero sum game in terms of the time that I have to play published games versus to be play testing my own stuff. Um, so there's a little bit of that. But I do think the success of Wingspan mostly has bought me a lot of freedom. Like my other friends who are trying to make it as full-time designers, there's much more of a grind to it and maybe working on stuff that isn't always a passion project. Um, and I've got a little bit more breathing room. So that's kind of a nice luxury. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So w when you talk about things not working and you shelving them, um, what... What is the game that has frustrated you the most as you attempt to work on it? I haven't shelved that many games. <laughs> I can, so the stunt me both game, I can't figure out like what, how to score it. That is accommodating to people of varying dexterity levels. I think it might need to be a co-op. So, but like, how frustrating is that? I just like set it aside and haven't come back. So I'm not like beating my head against it. I mean, I think maybe Wingspan. I spent years on Wingspan and I was really like starting from scratch and learning the craft. Um, so probably that. And the development with Jamie where like we went through several rounds of like, what if this, what if that, what if this? And like many different use chases before it sort of ended up where it is now. Um, and part of that was because I didn't realize like how willing he was for me to just be like, that's a terrible idea. We're not even going to try that. <laughs> um, or to, you know, like try it once and, and be confident that like it was fundamentally flawed. I think I spent a few months of my life working on things. I mean, you know, as a side gig, working on things that ended up not going anywhere. Uh, so that was probably the most frustrating, but I think I learned a lot through the process and I, I think I really built up my gut instincts for what will work and what won't, or what is working and what isn't working, those sorts of things. So I think it was still valuable to go through, but it's never fun to like build out a whole system and then decide that it's not working. Yeah, I can imagine that. How can I imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this actually leads into um, another kind of line of questioning, which is, so you've, you know what it's like to work very closely with a developer. Um, and now, yeah. uh, at least in the case of Wormspan, uh, you've become a developer. Uh, how does that feel different to you from game design and which lessons cross applied yeah. and what did you have to learn fresh? I mean, so Developer for Wormspan is a weird title. I don't think, I, I think it's right that Jamie gave me that credit, but I don't, I think he's using it in a different way from what most game developers do. Um, and it's partly because of his process when he's developing games, I think. So, so Stonemeyer in general, if you sign a game with them, um, at least my experience and Connie's experience, and I think also Matthew and Ben, um, Matthew O'Malley and Ben Rossett, who have Between Two Cities um, and Between Two Castles. Um, I think for all of us, we were always in control of the prototype and always the ones doing the playtesting outside of the blind playtesting process. Um, like Jamie as the developer um, never like took the game and was just like, here, I'll work on it for a little while. It was more like, here, I'll play test it a couple of times and then we'll talk or send emails about what could happen next. And then we all implemented it, which was still definitely development. Um, but I think very different from a lot of other companies where like you're handing it over to someone and they're like working on it and sort of taking it the final 10% of the way. Um, so that's the baseline for Stonemaier. And then Wormspan was a weird case, right? Because we wanted it to be sort of like a game that felt like it was in the family with Wingspan, but a separate like standalone game that's like noticeably different. Um, so my role as a developer on that game was mostly playing it with Connie at several different points in the process of her design process, um, way before you would ever give it to a developer normally and having really interesting conversations about like, 
what makes wingspan feel like wingspan? What, like, what are the core pieces of that? What do we need in wormspan? And, and how far away from that core is too far? And then like, what are interesting things that can be layered on it? Um, that take it like we always knew we wanted it to be sort of another notch up in complexity so um and that's sort of connie's sweet spot anyway as a designer so that worked great um so i never took it over as a developer would at many other companies um it was always in connie's hands um so it was really play testing with her a bunch of times and and just sort of giving feedback at that level um which isn't that different from what I do when I play test with her normally on her other games in a way, except that I had, I mean, I would say actually the, the other fundamental thing that I did in that process was I, she had a head start because she had like my spreadsheets for how I design wingspan cards and how the balancing works um, and that sort of stuff, which again, like usually developers are not involved at the beginning of like getting someone started in that way. So it's a, so it's a weird it's a weird credit, but it's probably the right word to put on it still that I was a developer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And it sounds like um, Connie is somebody that you play with frequently. So before yeah. you were Connie Volkman's developer, uh, were y'all already friends? And how did yeah. how did all of uh, how did all of this working together impact your relationship? Oh, it's been fun. It's been an excuse to see her more often. <laughs> um, and I just really respect her as a designer. I think she's really smart. Um, and yeah, we have a, a group of folks that get together um, here in the DC area and play test each other's games. So I saw Apiary before she ever pitched it to Stonemeyer, and um, it's been really fun to see her succeed with both of these games. That's fantastic. Yeah. So back to science for just a bit. Um, you know, one thing that I uh, was very fascinated by kind of as watching your games come out over time um, is that I never really thought of science games as courting controversy the way that history games do. Like I spent a lot of my time, you know, slinging little verbal shots about, you know, whether a historical theme is, you know, above board or like how we should represent things historically. Um, but then the Fox experiment <laughs> came out. Uh, and, and, and people really, I think some people were super just into it, period. And the others struggled with the theme. Uh, is that something that yeah. was a surprise to you? And how did it, I guess, impact you as somebody who's saying things about scientific history and scientific themes? Yeah, it surprised me a little bit. I, I think some of it's fair. Um, there was a period in the experiment when the foxes were not treated well. I think now they are better treated. Um, at the same time, like, ha it's weird to me because I don't see the same level of criticism about games about war, for example, or like other things, like where people are being killed. People aren't like, oh, I'm not going to play that game because it's about killing other people which to me seems more impactful than whether a fox is in a cage or not. Um, as, as horrible as it is to keep a fox in a small cage, you know what I'm saying? And like, are you also opposed to factory farmed meat or are you still eating it? Like, <laughs> I'm just curious about how internally consistent some of the people who are leveling that criticism at the game are being, but I think it is a fair criticism. Um, but I think it's also a really fascinating point in history and um, in the history of science. Uh, I thought it was worth exploring on that level. Um, and we don't ask the players to be putting their foxes in cages. Like we, we just chose not to engage with that part of the history of the experiment for, you know, and people are welcome to have whatever opinion they want about that choice um but you know i wanted to keep it pretty light and to get into the cool genetic stuff that they discovered um over the years in the experiment so that's where i chose to take it i think also that it's possible that the, the name the fox experiment sort of evokes pictures in people's minds of the foxes being like poked and prodded which my understanding is that they generally were not like they were living 
decently happy fox lives, at least after they got past the tiny cage stage of the experiment. I don't know. Um, yeah, and I, I, it's possible that I was led a little bit down sort of the primrose path on this. Uh, my main source for the game was a book called uh, To Tame a Fox, I think is the name of it. And um, it's really fascinating about the history of the experiment, the science of the experiment, and does not get into animal welfare at all. It is definitely sort of pro- um the people who founded the whole experiment and, and just doesn't get into it much um so it wasn't on my mind that much when i was designing honestly and so i was a little surprised when when people brought it up after because i hadn't thought as hard about it do you think that um kind of sparking these kinds of hard conversations will actually I think maybe eventually lead to better games on scientific themes that push Probably, more and yeah. more. Yeah. No, I'm happy to have the conversation. By yeah. the way, just a public service announcement for everyone. I looked up how to tame a fox on Amazon. And the first thing that came up is the correct hit, how to tame a fox and build a dog. Uh, but then right yes. under it is a different to tame a fox that is not appropriate for this podcast. Oh God. <laughs> 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 really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. The author's name is Leo Dugatkin, I think it is. D U G A T K I N. He actually, um, we got him to like read through the rule book and, and comment on the way that we were portraying things. Um, so that was kind of cool to connect with him because he had, he co wrote it with um, one of the women who started this experiment in the 1950s is still there. And he went and spoke with her a lot and and um she's a co-author of this this book that sort of tells the story of the whole the whole thing uh have there been other situations where you have had like a scientific consultant the way that you might have a historical consultant for your games or do you just typically do your own research and, and let it roll um with undergrove when we were starting to think about how we wanted the mechanics to work um we tracked down a mycologist who's also a little bit of a gamer and had some conversations with her about like, well, no, it was, I think it's actually that her partner's a gamer. She's not that much of a gamer, but she had done one of the experiments where um, she found in her PhD research that, that uh, there's some evidence of kin selection in the way that carbon is getting transferred among trees and they don't totally understand why and we were really fascinated by that and trying to figure out that's another case of like do we include that in the game they don't really understand why and not everyone agrees that it actually happens but it's pretty dang cool so <laughs> maybe we'll go there um so we talked to her a little bit and then on the other end once it was pretty much done i, I play tested it with some some people are mycologists but it's still like that and and when wingspan came out too i was like super nervous that people in the birding community or ornithologists would be like no this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong i don't know with the undergrowth it's I, it's so much less settled the um like people don't totally understand how this the system of trading resources between mushrooms and trees like Everyone seems to agree that that does happen, but there's not a great understanding of how or, or why. Um, so it's a little bit weird to be trying to model it in a game when the science is pretty unsettled. Um, and we just chose to let that give us more freedom. That's cool, though. I mean, I, now do you find yourself kind of looking at papers to see if there are updates? Like, now that this game is out of the world, would you be interested <laughs> right? in mushroom updates? <laughs> I, yes, but not only because of the game. I mean, it's just something that I'm interested in in general. I'm, I'm really active in our local mushroom club, and um, I just think it's fascinating. What do you do in mushroom club? This sounds cool. Can you talk about mushroom club? <laughs> <laughs> so the Mycological Association of Washington, D.C. Um, has like 800 members, um, almost all just amateur mushroom interested people. We do have a few professional mycologists who like work for the USDA. Um, 
or other related type jobs. But uh, yeah, we go out and look for mushrooms and talk about mushrooms. We have like a monthly speaker who talks about some anything from like our last guy was like how he figured out that certain Amanita mushrooms seem to be not having sex, but procreating anyway, or like, yeah, the like weird DNA stuff, but the other ones will be just like, okay, here's how you like figure out what mushroom you're looking at in this group of mushrooms or all kinds of stuff. I don't know. We get together, we go on walks in the woods and look for mushrooms. We have a annual retreat where we go stay at a summer camp and look for mushrooms. <laughs> we cook mushrooms. There's a group of people that have started brewing beer, which is fungal yeasts are part of kingdom fungi and then also sometimes um putting mushroom other mushrooms besides yeast in the beer this sounds like a fantastic club to be honest with it's you. great <laughs> and it's like and it's my people right like it's just folks that like are super curious about the science and also want to go hiking in the woods it's my people <laughs> <laughs> So um, it sounds like, you know, your design career so far has been deeply satisfying internally as well as, as externally. Uh, and it seems like you want to, you know, I mean, the mushroom people are your people, but also it sounds like other game designers are your people, uh, yes. given that you have um, become a co-founder of the Tabletop Game Designers Association. Yeah, uh, yeah. Would you be willing to comment a bit on how this idea came to be and kind of where you're hoping it's going to go? Um, I would say Jeff Engelstein is really like the driving force between behind finally making this happen. Um, and he recruited uh, me and Sunfung Lim to kind of help get it off the ground. I think me, in part because of the role I've been taking, sort of advocating for women in the industry, but also because of the conversations that uh, Jeff and I have had about some contracting frustrations that I've had. And that's sort of one of the passions that I am bringing to this organization because I think a lot of um, new designers and actually more experienced designers too, like are signing contracts that they don't really understand what the contract says. They don't know what they could be asking for to make the contract stronger. So I've been actually working on a big um, document for folks that's like, these are things that you could ask your publisher to put in your contract that would be more favorable for you um, and those sorts of things. Um, I think we're hoping it will also be a good source of networking for designers. So if you're thinking about signing a game with a publisher you can like figure out who else has published with them and like get some references and make sure there's someone you want to work with make sure they pay their royalties on time and those sorts of things um we've been talking a fair amount with the the german game designers association which has existed for quite a while and they do a fair amount of like when something's going wrong between a designer and a publisher sort of trying to get to the bottom of it they have a newsletter where they publish some of the complaints that people have. And so I think that's sort of a little stick that they have of like, if y'all don't work this out with this designer, we're going to just put it in our newsletter that you're screwing people over. Right. Um, so that's appealing to me. I, Cause I think within the, the industry, there's sort of a whisper network where if you know lots of other designers, you've heard which publishers are bad to work for. Um, but if you're brand new, you don't know who to talk to, to get that word of mouth. So that's a whole piece of it. And then I think we're hoping we'll do like some educational stuff and, um, we need to still do a lot more listening about what people think they could get out of an organization like this. Um, so it'll, it'll definitely be an, an evolving beast over the next few years. Um, but we are hoping to hoping to um open it up sometime soon and we're we're like getting the systems in place to even take memberships um but once that's sort of up we'll be ready to get people on board and and uh 
start figuring out what it's really going to look like. Ooh. So um, this, I mean, it's just called an association. I've heard a couple yes. people toss around the term union, but would you say that that is an accurate description or no? And why or why not? No, I mean, in the United States, that's an entirely different legal entity um, and we are not going that route. Um, but it is also not a 501c3 for whatever that means to people like, which if, if you're like an outright nonprofit 501c3, you cannot lobby for policy changes. Um, and we did not want that restriction. So um, we're a, like a trade organization, like the American Medical Organ Association or, you know, any trade organization that tries to represent its members. So that, you know, and, and I didn't talk about that in my first spiel about what it could be, but, but um, I do think there are policy changes that we could advocate for at the government level or also like one thing I've heard people mention is like why on Amazon if you go searching for a game is the game designer's name not listed like you can't search by game designer um so you know because SAS in Germany is the organization that is responsible for getting game designers names on boxes uh using as a reference point like all books have the author's name on them. Why wouldn't a game in Germany game designers are called authors. Like they see that as a very parallel, um, sort of situation. And, and so like, if you can search for an author on Amazon or on whatever other thing, like, why shouldn't you be able to search for a game designer? So that's one, one kind of thing that we might pursue. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out as we go along. <laughs> I mean, I, I do agree that, you know, a game designer and an author, it's not really that different. It's different from being a songwriter. You deserve a songwriting credit, um, right. a director, an actor. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, we all deserve our billing. Uh, so the other thing I kind of wondered about going into this, just because I always think about, you know, what are we taking responsibility for when we do things. Uh, so if we're talking about, for example, um, kind of bringing the whisper network into something that's a bit more open, um, people whisper because they are afraid of consequences. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so is there anything that TTGDA can actually do about that? Or is this just going to have to be like a solidarity in numbers getting you to speak out kind of thing? I mean, I think one of it is that people are usually willing to to talk about things behind the scenes. So one of them is one thing is just like helping people get in touch with each other um, so that you can figure out who has had, I mean, I guess you can go on BGG and figure out who has published games with this publisher, but you don't necessarily know how to get in touch with them. Um, and so this would be a way to maybe find people if we can get enough people into the organization. Um, I mean, I think it would be really cool to build sort of a database of like, yes or no, did this publisher pay you? Like really factual things about how they were to work with. I think once you get into like, did you like them? I mean, you can rate them, but that's like less concrete and right. still worthy, but maybe like squishier as an organization. Do you want to publish that information? Yeah. Um, but uh, so that's something we're still sort of trying to figure out what what something like that could look like. If if another thing we've talked about is like if publishers are willing to submit their standard contract to us and we could look at it and say, like, yeah, this is a pretty fair contract. But like you get our seal of approval, at least on that level. And um, that would be another thing we could do. Yeah, I will say I've had tremendous good fortune in negotiating my first contract because I did it with David Thompson, who's negotiated many a contract. Right. And so, you know, we were definitely 50-50 on design for Night Witches, but I leaned on him hard to help me assess what a good yeah. deal should look like. Right, because people don't even know what they can ask for. And especially with your first game, you're so excited that anybody even wants to put it out in the world. Like, I think a lot of people accept deals they probably shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So w just kind of as a preview, since just because we're here, we could talk about it. What are some things that you do think should go into a game contract? Um, and not be joining it. Yeah. Uh, you should always ask for an advance. I think that's 
probably your best way of um, either getting the publisher to feel like they have enough skin in the game that they're really going to get your game out or at least being compensated when they don't get your game out because you get to keep the advance anyway. And so like for the year or two or however long that it, you weren't shopping it around to someone else, at least you get to keep your advance. Um, number two, I would say is make sure that the it's written in a way that the, the rights to your game revert to you, that you're not number one, signing away forever. You're not assigning it to them, that it's just a license and that that license has an end date and it can be renewed if everything is going well, but you have ways to end it if it's not going well, or if they never put out your game. And so like, I was just talking to someone who he realized only too late that his rights to the game only reverted to him if it was out of print after having been published, but it mm. never got published. And so after many years of it not getting published, he went to the publisher and was like, oh, hey, are you ever gonna do anything with that? Can I have it back? And they said, no, we don't have to give it to you. Um, That's so infuriating on a number of levels. I'm just gonna sit here and process yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So like that, like those are the fundamental kinds of things that we're trying to, um, that's like base, base level, like gotta have those in your contract. And then that I have a long, long document now of like all the other things that people have said to me that they, um, now include in their contracts. Like over time, I have included more stuff in my contract about how hands-on I want to be and sort of the communication process in my game development process like i want you to show me what you're doing and let me play test it periodically and i want to sign off on the final print files and i want an actual reasonable amount of time to go through all the print files not like oh we're sending this tomorrow do you want to double check everything like, no cool. i want a week to look at that <laughs> um so those sorts of things which often are not in contracts um but I now yeah. have had one experience where someone tried to send me something to look at, you know, in less than 24 hours. And I was like, I have five days to look at this contractually, um, which was helpful. That's, that's a smart thing to put. Yeah, I don't think that is in our contract, but at the same time. It's, it's I mean, rare, I think. Yeah. But I've, I, one of my publishers had it in their standard contract and I was like, oh yeah, I do want that. <laughs> that is good. Also, yeah. maybe everybody seeing each other's standard contracts might be good. Like, yeah, right, I'm right. New... And so I've been asking people to send me stuff, and I've been sort of compiling, like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I knew what an okay royalty percentage to ask for would be, because David has had so many percentages right. that we were able to come up with a reasonable number and that we could split. Yeah. And so yeah. I would not have known like what percentage I should ask for, I should negotiate for, I was entitled to without that information. Right. Uh, right. Of course, this also leads to the uncomfortable question of money and how much people should make. Right, I think you will still get a little like, uh, uh, Cardboard Edison does a survey periodically where they ask people. And so we know that the average in the industry is like six to 8%, I think is the most common range. Um, if you're an experienced designer, you might be able to ask for, couple of percentage points more than that. Um, and there might be reason, like if it's, if there's a licensed IP involved, then you have to go lower because, um, they're paying part of them, basically giving part of your royalty to the IP, but hopefully they're going to sell 10 times more copies and it's all fine. Um, yeah, so there's, that's definitely, that's a hard one. Cause it's hard to like set and, set a standard but i think sharing information and about what people have been able to ask for and, yeah um yeah i think at least like giving percentages is probably good right right because that varies but you know this is a reasonable for you know you don't have to take two percent or whatever <laughs> like, that's not a good right idea. right <laughs> well and how it's all structured it's and it's like it's okay seven percent of what yeah that's another really important thing to understand in contracts that when we say 7%, it's 7% of the publisher's revenue. Right, um, not profit. Because otherwise we're going to spend everything the same right. in profit. 
Right. If they say profit, they can subtract out whatever expenses they want to. But even if they call it revenue, there are publishers that are starting to try and say, okay, revenue minus this and that and the other thing. And pretty soon you're starting to get into like pretty squirrely territory. Um, so yeah, you really, you want like seven, eight percent of revenue would be a very respectable contract as I understand it. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So I guess the other question too, is that, so since we will, uh, we will all as members of this be in it together, um, do you think that kind of talking about these things creates, I mean, you know, the idea is, I guess, if there are bad reports about a publisher that a number of people won't work with them, but since it's not a union, you also can't exactly scab. So like, <laughs> how are, how are we mm. like, I mean, wh what do you think that we as game designers owe each other at least at a base level that's an interesting way to put it like, <laughs> <laughs> like if, if we're team game designer and that's the team we're on yeah like... yeah i mean i i'm hoping that we can put structures in place that make it easier for people to share the information that i do feel like at a certain level I don't know if I feel that people owe it to everyone to, to say things publicly, because that mm -hmm. is again, like really uncomfortable. It can make you look like a real jerk in the industry to other publishers too. But I hope we can get some sort of system in place where at least you feel like you owe it to other designers to be available. If they want to sign a game with a publisher that you've worked with, that you can be available to other people to tell them at least privately, if not publicly, whether you think they should and what the pros and cons of that particular publisher are. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it also yeah. leads me to wonder, you know, what do we, I mean, do, do the things that we experience as designers also, I mean, are we going to be interested in how artists are treated, how employees of a publisher are treated? So, I mean, right. I will note that the Fox experiment came out in the midst of a Pandasaurus scandal about worker treatment. It sure did. So. <laughs> it sure did. I would have plenty of things to say for anyone that wants to talk to me about what it's like to work for Pentasaur. <laughs> <laughs> you can trust me. I'm only media. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. And so, and, and I think it's good for designers to talk to, you know, multiple people when you can, if it's not too new a, a company um, and get like, Oh, am I hearing the same thing over and over? Or did different people have different experiences and maybe why? And um yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's a tough, it's a tough go. Um, and then I guess as as the years have gone by, you know, you mentioned that you're also involved in TTGDA because you are um you're interested in activism for women in in the gaming industry. How do you feel things have changed since your work began? And what things remain frustratingly unchanged? Um, so I was just at Unpub this weekend, which is a playtesting convention in Baltimore, um, which is why my voice is quite hoarse. I'm really hearing it as we're talking. Um, and for years at Unpub, we have had a breakfast on the first on the Saturday morning. So before there's some playtesting now on Fridays, but Saturday morning is sort of before the big day of playtesting at Unpub. And I for women and now that we call it signal boost and it's sort of for anyone from an underrepresented group in sort of demographically in gaming. Um and I remember the first breakfast was maybe dozen to 15 ish people women and now it's like a room of people with multiple tables in it um so it's like it's definitely changing um you feel it when you walk into the room now at the, in the big playtesting hall too like i think the demographics of people playing games are changing and that's bleeding that over into who becomes a designer right um so that's all good and there are publishers sometimes who come to me and are like where do i find the women like tell me when you see good designs by women we want to sign more women like there's people who are aware of it 
um, and thinking about it and trying to be proactive. We're seeing things like the Zenobia Award that's trying to really like provide some mentorship specifically to underrepresented demographics, um, which I talked to them when they're starting. I don't know if they also heard this from other people, but I was like, I, I felt like that's part of what was missing is like it's all well and good to have a design contest and tell people like submit your games to us but like people fall out of that process before they make it to to submitting a game to a game design contest and if you can help people along that stretch of like what am i actually doing how do i do this how do i find play testers what makes a game good all of that stuff and get them sort of up and going a little bit more and then they can pass that along into the next generation that are coming through. I think that's going to make a difference. And I, and I think what we see with Zenobia is really interesting topics for the games too. Like I do think that expanding the demographics of who is designing games is going to expand what we see happening in the gaming space. And that's so interesting to me. I forget if I've answered your question now. What still needs no, to be no. done? Yes. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, there's so much evidence across the board in the world, not, you know, outside of gaming about unconscious bias that I do think it's something we still have to worry about happening that um, if publishers aren't being very conscious about wanting to expand their catalog of designers that they're going to be reinforcing the status quo um without thinking about it because the default is the status quo um and it, and there's a lot of that just built into the economics of the gaming world that like it's a much safer bet to put out a game by someone who's already been published yeah um and so that really reinforces the status quo um so i think it, the more publishers we can get to think about that dynamic and to realize that that's um that's something that they can proactively decide to break out of that pattern um i think that can help a lot but but again i think that we got to, most of what needs to happen is before you get to the point of pitching to publishers. It's not, I don't think it's that that many publishers are, are being horribly biased against signing games by people from underrepresented demographics. It's that we need to get more people comfortable with the idea of designing games and that that's a thing that anybody can do. Um, and that you can make games about, anything so like just because the market currently doesn't have a game that's appealing like that's how i designed wingspan was like why is everything about castles and spaceships like i i wanted a game to exist that was about something i was into and it turns out that there was a lot of appetite for that and i think we'll see that over and over as as we get more different more diversity in the the population of designers like so, oh who knew there was so much demand for games about something <laughs> we haven't even thought about yet oh yeah i can't wait until my current generation of students like gets to what i what do they want to design i don't know if i'll understand it but i support it <laughs> <laughs> totally so speaking of kind of helping people along the process um you know it's hard to find and effectively mentor people uh who yeah. aren't self-selecting especially how how do you how do we do a better job of catching people early on and helping to support them through a process that just kind of weeds a lot of people out along the way yeah that's a really good question i don't totally know the answer to that um well, one thing that i try to do and this is not a route that everyone 
is going to have available to them. <laughs> She'll realize on it. But like when people come up to me and ask me like, how do I do whatever? And like, like have very like designery questions for me. I'll be like, Oh, are you asking this because you're thinking of designing a game? And often if it's a woman, they'll be like, yeah, I've kind of thought about it. And one thing that I always say is, you know exactly as much about game design as I did when I started. Like, I think for a lot of people, they feel like they have to like have some magical knowledge to get going. And while it would be nice, that is not where most designers start. Like most people do it as a side gig. They don't go to game design school, even though that's a thing that exists because you're very unlikely to ever make money at it. So don't, don't spend money on classes. But, <laughs> um, but you can, it's a thing you can learn by doing it and by playing games, honestly. Like half of being a good game designer is playing a lot of games and, and thinking critically about what makes them work. Um, so yeah, I just, I try to really get like, I think that's the point when you need to get people and it's just like random conversations that you're having with people outside of design contexts. Like if you ever see that glimmer of a spark of like someone's curious about how game design works to like not jump on it so much that it scares them away, but jump on it a little bit and um, let them know like how much everyone's just flying by the seat of their pants and that it's not that we have some special ordained knowledge that no one else can have. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting because I think a lot of people, it doesn't even occur to them how games make, like, are made. Like I, I remember the time that I, I ran into a friend of mine from high school and he was like, Oh, I've been playtesting for this friend of mine. I was like, Oh, what's that? How's that? And it's like the first time that it occurred to me that people made games like that. They came from somewhere, right? <laughs> what? It did just come out of your head like Athena springing from... <laughs> right. And then it turns out that this friend of mine had been playtesting Pandemic. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess if there's a collective action we can all take in or out of the Tabletop and Game Designers Association, it's be encouraging to other designers. Yeah. Like people and I who think... might design but don't yet. And I think even before that stuff is to like, think about who you're gaming with. And if it's not a well-rounded group demographically, like, why is that? Um, if it's at a time when people in couples are having to split up because someone has to go put the kids to bed and the other person is gaming, like that's fundamentally gonna like, exclude more often women than men because that is what happens in our culture right now um and so like gaming at my house happens at two o'clock on a saturday afternoon and it's total chaos because there are lots of kids but the spouses all come right <laughs> um so it's thinking about stuff like that too, because all the designers have to have to be gamers. Most designers start out as pretty heavy gamers first. Um, and so we got to like, even out the gaming scene. That makes a lot of sense. And it's, I mean, it's harder than it sounds, but it's also something we can all take steps to do. Right. So speaking of games and having games at your house at two o'clock, uh, what <laughs> games have you been playing recently that really bring you joy? One that um, my spouse and my friends all really want to play and I really enjoy too, but they're like, this is the one they're asking for right now is um, First in Flight, which has been kind of oh, under yeah. the radar, but it's uh, it's from Genius Games and Artana. Uh by Matthew O'Malley and Ben Rossett. And it's a push your luck deck builder about, about a historical topic. It's about like the early Wright brothers era of building airplanes. And so um, you're, you're pushing your luck in the sense that you have a deck 
um, with a bunch of cards that have little distances on them. So one, one, you know, I'm flying one, I'm flying two, I'm flying three, you're trying to get to 40. But you, in that deck are also um, design flaws with your aircraft that will make you crash. And you don't know where they are in your deck, right? So you're like, how far can I fly before I crash? And can I like come in for a gentle landing without crashing? Because that will be better in the long run. Um, and so it's really clever because there's there's quite a bit of uncertainty. But over the course of the game, you're doing stuff that sort of builds up your deck. And so you're taking these longer and longer flights, which is very satisfying. But there's that tension of the push your luck of like, uh, I really need like three more distance but i could crash do i go for it you know that kind of thing <laughs> it's it's a great game uh so we've been playing a lot of that been playing some arc nova uh what else those are the two that come to mind right now uh, trio for a on the lighter end have you seen trio no um it's a game that's originally Japanese, the U.S. market. It's um, a brand new company called Happy Camper, which is started by someone who used to be at Game Right for a million years. Um, but uh, it's a really visually pleasing ca card game, um, just numbers. And it's like this premise, I'm going to describe it and you're going to think it sounds horrible, but it's great. It is like <laughs> go fish crossed with memory, <laughs> but it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a hand of cards. You have to put them in your hand. You have to keep them in the order they're in. In and they're in order. And on your turn, you have to basically go fishing for three of the same number. But you have to ask people, "What's your lowest card, or what's your highest card?" You can only look at the cards on the end, lowest or highest. And if you can ask for any combination of cards from anyone at the table, including yourself, lowest or highest, or there's a few on the table that are face down and they get flipped over. Um, if you can find three of the same number, then you've got a set, a trio. And if you can get a trio of trios, you win the game. Oh, well, that sounds but fun, actually. Like it's it's a nice, light little game, but it's a, it's super interesting. It's a really interesting dynamic. So that's that's like our fun little filler game that we've been playing a lot of. That's awesome. And if people want to track your activities online, where can you be found? Um, I have a website that's the first four letters of my name and then my last name. So elizhargrave.com. Um, and that has links to like my blue sky. And I have a newsletter uh, for folks in the DC area. I have a playtesting uh, list you can sign up for. All that kind of stuff. Fantastic. Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been such a delight to get to have a conversation with you. I really appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And I'm looking forward to whatever's next with the Tabletop Game Designers Association. <laughs> yeah, that should be over the next month or two. Or two. We're going to get stuff out. Yep. All right. Everybody out there, links for everything are in the show notes. Um, I can be found anywhere online as Beyond Solitaire. And uh, please like, subscribe, ask questions. Most of all, happy gaming.